I'm blessed to be up here. I, I would have never known or thought that I get to do this, so I'm really excited. I started coming here in 2017. It's really easy for me to get here. It's a 15-minute drive from my house, so it makes this a great conference for me to come to and exhibit at, and I love having conversations with people thinking about missions. I'm going to start this. I'll, I'll talk about SIM and talk about myself a little bit more, but talk about mainly what we're going to talk about, which is support raising, but let me pray first because prayer is a huge part of this. So, Father, I thank you for these men and women that are here. Lord, and I pray that they hear from you, not from me. God, speak through me your words. Encourage their hearts, Father. Help them to know that it's all yours. And, Father, just to take the next step in obedience and trust you, to follow you, and to do your will. Lord, in Jesus' name, encourage these men and women. And amen. So let's see, where am I? Sorry, I'm opening this. When I first heard about missions, it was from two doctors that were home on home assignment at camp. He talked about that. And they were telling me about how God was coming to people in dreams and visions. And lives were being changed. And I was amazed because I knew that happened in the Bible. I'm one of those people, I read the whole Bible before I became a believer. I had to understand what I was saying yes to. And I had to also understand what I was walking away from. Being Jewish, I figured I had to at least read the Old Testament. And then and people say, what happened? I said, I just kept reading. There's a whole new part of the book. And so I kept reading. And it's, it's so good. And I follow a Jewish rabbi. His name happens to be Jesus. You know, so it's really good. But, but when I heard about those things happening, I'm like, I guess I believe that the things that happened in the Bible still happen today. And I'm more and more sure every year that the things that happen in the Bible still happen today. So God still appears and talks to people in dreams and visions. My wife, when we were first invited to Nigeria, said no. But God gave her a vision that night. She didn't tell me about it for a year. Okay, but she said, go find out more. Literally, we were on a support appointment, raising support to go to Africa. When she told someone the story, I'm like, what? You know, I don't just, it's amazing what God does. When people say, how did you pick SIM? There's a, there's a, in case you're not sure and you really haven't walked around the bowl downstairs, I remember this is a basketball arena, but I really think it's cool as a church too. Um, there's so many great mission organizations down there. SIM is just one of them. But people asked, how did we pick SIM? I'm like, I didn't know there were other choices. I mean, it was really simple. The missionaries I met were with SIM. And so we just picked them. But SIM has been around since 1893. They started as Sudan Interior Mission. They were just in the heart of Africa. And now they're in over 80 countries and six different continents. We do, one of the big things we do is medical missions. But I work with street kids. I am not medical. But I love talking to people that are doctors. When I was at a conference a couple years ago, I had a doctor come up to me. And he asked me the question, what would it look like for me to bring my children? He goes, my baby's right there my children and my wife overseas and raise a family working as a doctor overseas. I turned around and there was a man that had been serving, had served overseas for over 20 years as a surgeon. I said, Bill, four of his kids were born over in Nigeria. I said, come talk to him. They talked for an hour about what it would look like. God is there. God is in all these conversations. And so we need to trust that. And we need to know what we've got. So I'm going to change this. We're going to go on to the next one. Sorry. This is that. I'm a little behind. The Bible. So who does, who does the Bible say God is? And I'm sorry, when I ask questions, they're not rhetorical for the most part. Who does the Bible say God is? Feel free to shout it out. Father, creator, I am. Yeah. yeah. Owner. It's all his. You know, Genesis 1.1 in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I love how, it, I love how John 1.1 1, 1 ties into that. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. He's creator. We need to remember that. In, in support raising, we need to remember who God is. And if God is leading you to go, we don't need to worry about the rest. Let's take the 30,000-foot view. He's calling you. It's all his. He's also our provider. 
I, I worked in sales for years, and I, I made money on commission. If someone didn't buy or someone didn't sell, I didn't make anything. I've worked in missions for over 10 years. If God doesn't provide with partners, I, I'm in trouble, but it's all his, and I have to trust. And so it's really cool. I went from living on commission 100% to living on 100% commission in a different way. I, he's providing for me in everything I do. And even in a corporate job, guess what? God's providing your, your salary. Whether you work, you're a doctor working in a hospital, you're a doctor working in a practice, God's still providing. And we need to remember that. Psalm 50, 10 and 11 says, For every beast on the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. He's creator. He's provider. We don't need to worry. I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm really good at worrying. One, one of the reasons I teach this is because I struggle with it at times. I, I can look back. I know God's provided for over 10 years. I know missionaries that have been on the field for over 40 years that God has provided for their, everything they need. So I tell you this again and again because he tells me things again and again so I remember them and I hear them. I'm telling you this because I want you to hear it and know it. And he wants you to hear and know that he's got it. If he's leading you to take that next step, don't let money be your fear. There's a really cool organization downstairs called MedSend. If you have medical school debt and you want to go to the mission field, they'll pick up your, bill, they'll pick up your med school debt while you're overseas. You can go talk to them. Talk to Samaritan's Purse. They'll help with that. Hear me. There's great organizations downstairs. And one of the reasons I love talking about other orgs we're all in this together. Uh, we all want the same thing. Why does SIM do this? Why do the other orgs do this? We want God's name to be known on all the earth. And so that's why we're doing it. God has infinite resources. Matthew 6 says, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. The birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I, I hope you don't mind scripture. I love scripture because it tells me I'm on the right path. It's, it's not my words. It's his words. It's not me, me saying he's got it. It's him saying he's got it. I rest in that. I promise you, when I was first going to the mission field in 2004, I used to sell houses. I'd sell 10 a month easy. God shut our business down. I started selling zero a month for three months in a row. I, w I laid awake at night saying, God, I'm, I'm really confused. Are you sure? And, and money wasn't coming in at first, and, and all of a sudden it was all there. And he had it all. And when I looked at the year back, and we had a great year. And God provided everything we need. But in my sight, in my view, I get nervous. I want to stress out and I want to hold the weight. But God says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He tells us to take his yoke. He'll take ours. His is light. I think mine is heavy, but I think it's really light for him too. You know, and so we just need to relax and rest in him. He told Moses, I am who I am. 
I love Philippians, so I'm finally going to get some New Testament. Philippians 4, 4 through 7, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So we're to rejoice in him in all things. Let your reasonableness be known to all. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Look to his scripture. When you worry, look to his scripture. We're called to pray for our brothers and sisters. We watch those around us. I think one of the reasons that we struggle with support raising, one of the reasons I do is I think it's about me. Guess what? It's not. It's about him. I'm going in obedience. I would have never chose to go move to Africa without his leading. I mean, literally, the people invited us to go visit them in Nigeria. We took that as something totally different. We moved there. We, we only visited them before because here's the question I got when I was support raising. How do you know you're supposed to live there if you've never been? My wife had never been out of the country. We'd gone through all the training. There was no doubt in my mind. My in-law's mind, there were lots of questions. In my mind, there was no doubt. So we finally went for a week, and God confirmed it. It was really easy to raise support after we went. I could show pictures. I could tell people stories of where we're going to live. It was really easy. But it's, it's a trust and obedience thing. I recommend, by the way, that you do go first. I don't recommend you try it the way we did it, but I, I thought that's what I was supposed to do, just be obedient. But I just, literally, that question just kept coming up, and I know how to come, overcome objections. And that's one of the things you're going to learn. What do you do? What is the common thing someone keeps saying to you, and how do you figure out to get around that and have a conversation? How do you point back to God? How do you show them that he has it? So I'm not going to, by the way, if you came to this thinking I was going to give you a way to raise all your support within 45 minutes, I'm sorry. I'm going to give you resources for sure. I'll tell you about things like MedSend and Samaritan's Purse and some other organizations. But I'm going to tell you there's some books I can tell you that you should read. There's ways to do it. And I'm here to tell you that he not only will do it for you, he's done it for tens of thousands before you. I mean, it's probably literally hundreds of thousands. I just have to do a little bit more math. And we need to remember it's not about us. So what do I do when I support raise? I meet with people. Do you like having coffee with your friends? Do you like having meals with your friends? Yeah, you're getting to tell people about what God's doing, right? Here's the crazy thing. When I make the phone call or I sit down with someone to talk to them about what God is doing, a lot of times I'll find out it's not about me or my ministry or what God's doing in Africa or wherever I'm going. It's about that person and their walk with God. And you know what my job is then? Is it to tell them about what God's doing in Nigeria? No, it's to listen. It's to pray with them. It's to be a light for them. Because this is truly a partnership. I'm asking people to pray for me. I'm asking people to partner with me. But I'm partnering with them. I need to hear what's going on in their life. I need to walk alongside them. And it's really neat to see what God does with some of these conversations. Support raising, one of the most humbling things I've ever done, still is. It's also one of the most faith-building things, watching God provide. I'm starting to do development work for one, of the, for one of the parts of SIM called Sports Friends, which is a sports ministry, obviously, by the name. And just watching people or organizations give 10000 here or 15000 there, I'm like, wow. It's really cool. It's awesome. I mean, I came in here knowing that Stephen Foster was the plenary speaker and Stephen Foster works with SIM in Angola and Lakewood has made them, they're honoring him and honoring Angola and they're giving a gift to Angola that's amazing. It's really cool to see how God is providing for these things and doing the work. So we have to remember it's not all about us. God will also open new doors and new friendships for you. When I read the book that God asked, which I'll tell you about in a little bit, it talked about referrals. I said, how would that possibly work? How could a referral work? Well, when I was in real estate, people always asked for referrals for a plumber or a carpenter or a fix-it man. And I gave it and they'd believe it. 
So referrals work the same way. You ask people for their friends and they connect you. And I thought about it. Could referrals work for this? And I realized one of the missionaries we support, he called me up and said, hey, Herschel, so-and-so gave me your name. Can we meet and talk about what God is doing through the youth, through Campus Crusade? And I'm like, I'd love to. And the crazy thing is after that, I introduced him to everybody I knew because I wanted to see the work go forward. So it's not even about everybody you know. It's about other things. Here's one of my favorite pictures. If you're medical, this is such a cool picture. Sorry, I think so. If it bothers you, I apologize. This man has an arrow in his heart. So the story is this picture from Nigeria. When I lived there, this man was shot over a, a woman, and he couldn't find a hospital or anybody to help him because the arrow was in his heart. When his heart beat, the arrow pulsed, you know. And so he traveled three days on a bus to get to the hospital where we were. And there was a general surgeon and an ENT that met with him. And he spoke a different dialect. So we had to search for someone because they wanted, before they did the surgery, they wanted someone to share the gospel with him. Okay, there was an arrow in his heart. They did not know if he would live. They wanted him to hear the gospel before he went into surgery. Found someone that happened to be on the compound where the hospital was at that time. They shared the gospel with him. They did this surgery. They were able to get the arrow out and the other arrow out. It was an ENT and a general surgeon. They said one pulled the other one plugged. One pulled the other one plugged and they finally got it out. It was sweet. And not only did he live there, he was healed physically. He got to hear the gospel more and more. He got to see people live it out and love him right where he was. Because guess what? When he left his village, they pretty much thought he was dead. In Africa, when you're in a hospital, for sure in Nigeria, your family comes and takes care of you when you're in the hospital. They, they're the ones who get your meals. He had no one there. It was missionaries and workers that were loving him right where he was. Before he left, he was not only physically healed, he knew Christ is his Savior and he was spiritually healed. These are the opportunities you get if you use medicine for his glory. So one of my questions for you, if you're medical, do you pray with your patients? If not, why not? You surely can if you go to the mission field. It's a great opportunity to share the gospel and share the love of Christ and meet people where they are. It's a place to give them hope. When, when I got to Nigeria, one of the missionaries that grew up there, he, was an, he had been a missionary kid, grew up in Africa. He was an adult now with his family. He lived in Nigeria. And he and his family invited us over for dinner. And he said to me, Herschel, you got here because you put God first. I was very humble. I'm like, he sees me. He knows, he knows I'm all about God. And then he goes, but you have to keep God first now. Don't, don't forget that. In support raising and everything we do, we need to keep God first. Literally, it should be, whether it's in prayer or in his word, it should be one of the first things I do when I wake up. And I said, okay, God first and then my family. Or I said, God first and then my ministry. He goes, no, then your family. Because I thought God brought me there to do my ministry, right? Because I'm, I'm super, right? I'm really good with youth. And I was going to work with street kids. He really needed me there. He brought me there to fill a void. And he said, no, God brought you here for what he's going to do in you. I'm like, what? He said, he's going to work in you. And if you let him work in you and change you, he'll work through you. And your ministry will go well. And so God, if God's calling you to go somewhere, yeah, you're gonna, God will use you there, but he's going to work in you and change you. So be prepared. It's a beautiful thing. I'm, I promise you I'm a better person now than when I went. Um, and God is, God is to be glorified in that. It's all his, right? I live for him. I do all things for him. And it's about his glory. So we'll go to the next picture. But I love that picture. So as we go on, we're going to talk about the gospel. We're going again for the gospel. Share the gospel. One of the ways you do it is by video. Our ministry where I worked and served in Nigeria partnered with it. Uh, how outreach, they did health outreach. And we showed the video. We showed the Jesus film on video. People would travel, believe it or not, for days to come get free health care. And then at night we could show the Jesus film and introduce them. To, and sometimes it was really cool. They go... People would say, oh, that's the man in white from my dreams. 
it still happens. And this stuff is going on right now while we're sitting in this room. It's still happening. And you have to understand we can't do this alone. So if you're planning, you think your plan is, well, I'll wait till I retire and then I'll have enough money in my savings. I'm sorry, it's, it's not about you. The ministry, hear me, is also to the people that are partnering with you. They're partnering in prayer. They're partnering by giving. Some people can't or won't go. And their way of going is by helping send you. It's a blessing to them. When I lived overseas and people said, Herschel, thank you so much for going. I'm like, man, thanks for, thanks for paying me. Thanks for sending in the gift. I loved living in Africa. I, I don't know if you guys really read Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, and it talks about living about God's will from the beginning of the day till the end of the day and really waking up and doing it again. Here's what I didn't like about God's will. God's will was for me to leave Africa. I didn't want to go. He made it really evident that we were supposed to leave. And I'm like, okay, God, I hear you. I don't know if you've ever heard. I, I'd love to tell you, he doesn't call me. It's not like the phone rings. And I tell people all the time, if the phone rang and it said, God, I probably wouldn't answer. I might throw the phone a, a far distance. I said, okay, God, I negotiate. I negotiated before I ever came to faith. He really didn't answer any of those. He just told me it's a faith thing, you know, I negotiate. I said, God, I'm going, to throw, I'm going to throw my blanket out there. Hey, can you just confirm this through Christine, my wife, and have her come to me and tell me we're supposed to go back without me saying a word to her? And two days later, my wife came to me. She goes, hey, we need to talk. I said, okay. She goes, sit down. I said, I'm not going to sit. She goes, I, but I need you to pray about something. I said, go ahead. And she told me, God is letting me know we're supposed to move back to Texas. And I said, yeah, I know. She goes, what do you mean you know? You didn't say anything. And I was just waiting for God. God will confirm. He'll do it in one way or another. And if we're about his will, we have to do his will. I, I promise, didn't want to come back to the U.S. I never wanted to be a U.S.-based missionary. I, I'm like, I do not want to live on support in the U.S. I know how to work and I know how to provide. But, but God, it took me 10 years of being back in a career field for him to say, hey, I, I want you to do what I told you to do before. So I'm telling you, if God's urging you at all, listen. Don't let support raising be a part of the reason you don't do it. Hear me again and again. If he's called you, he's going to provide for you. It's all his. And when we talk about support raising, it's not just about finances. It's about prayer. I live in Houston. How many of y'all live in Houston? Okay. Okay. I literally usually say praise God when I, tra when I change lanes on I-10. 59 as well, you know, it's just, traffic here is crazy, y'all. I like to pray a lot. I live by Memorial Park. I go there daily and start my prayer walks. Sometimes prayer runs. Um, prayer is huge. And we need to be praying for others. I love praying with my fellow missionaries. There, there's my friend, I heard this sermon that he taught years ago. And it was titled, Pray, Give, Go. Because he said, some are called to pray, some are called to give, some are called to go. Some do two, some do, most missionaries do all three. Um, and so what's your part? So prayer is fantastic. When we went, we had a church that partnered with us in prayer, and they would pray for us in church during the service every month. How awesome is that? They said, we can't partner with you financially. I said, I'm blessed. A church, a whole church is praying for me. Come on. That's awesome. So you want to raise up prayer partners. At SIM, you, you're going to figure out how many financial partners we, it takes you. It's usually about 50 to 60. But we require an individual to have 200 prayer partners. And we require a family to have 400. Because that's how important we think it is. We want people praying. And as you pray for missionaries, if you don't know who to pray for, I've got some prayer cards at the SIM table. I did not bring any up here. But find missionaries or meet missionaries that are at one of the tables that you want to pray for and start praying for them. Go to Joshua Project and see who to pray for. Start praying for the world. There's, some, there's a thing called prayer cast. Prayer cast is another one. It will tell you, there is a video on countries that will give you the statistics 
And you could pray alongside prayer cast and pray for different countries. So, not rhetorical, what are some obstacles in support raising? Pride. Pride. Fear. Fear. You guys just named two of the biggest ones for sure. Anything else? Knowledge, lack of training, yes. You guys are, you guys are an excellent crowd. I like this. Yeah. And so it's trusting in the Lord, right? And, and there's ways to get trained. I take part in two-day trainings that we do with an organization called Via Generosity. And it's a boot camp. And what I love about it is it's not, the, the training isn't just me or someone else standing up there and telling you everything for two days and you just taking in the knowledge. There's a lot of practice. There's getting up. There's moving around. There's working together. There's relationships that are formed, and it really, it's a quick two days. At SIM, we do it in three days instead because we take some longer breaks because people have their kids with them. So I'm saying don't let fear or lack of knowledge or lack of training be the, the reasons you don't go. There's places to get that. At Via Generosity, they host boot camps in different states every month. And they're located in Arkansas. So they have one at least a couple times a year in Arkansas. They usually have one in Dallas. We've done it in Houston before. So overcome the obstacles. Don't let it, you don't get stuck in the mud. Literally, don't get stuck in the mud. There's no reason to. It's okay. Take steps of faith like Peter. Take the next step. God may not show you the whole journey yet. Just take the next step and trust him. Continue to seek him. Have people praying for you. Here's a couple great books. The God Asked by Steve Shadrach. When we first raised support in 2004 to go to Nigeria, that book wasn't written. And so we read another book. When I went back with SIM in 2016 and God raised our support again, that book was written and it really made a difference. It makes so much sense. And then there's a book by Scott Morton, who, Scott Morton, who's with Navigators, called Funding Your Ministry, also a fantastic book. There's other resources. Turning Donors into Partners by Brad Leyland. And I, you can come see me later if you want the resources. Or I can give you my business card and you can call me. But the boot camp is two or three days. It's fantastic. It really helps you to feel confident and know what you're doing. And you're going to practice and you understand it in a new way by the time you're done. So this is a picture I took when I was in Central Asia a couple years ago. Look, we don't know what our next step is going to look like. But are you willing to trust God? No matter how the road turns or where the road goes, are you willing to take that next step and trust God? What's going to encourage you in this journey? I'm going, to, I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and build a prayer team. Maybe it's five or ten to start with, not 200. Just if you're deciding what to do, build some prayer, have some prayer warriors around you praying with you on what your next steps are and what to do. What does it look like? I wanted. Let's see. That'll work though. All right, I'm going to show you a video. This is about support raising. This is about the people that do the boot camps. There's some podcasts out there as well. This is one of the podcasts it's talking about. So this is a one minute video. Whether they can give or they can't share about the ministry and ask with an expectation, they'll meet you but they're gonna match what energy and expectation you bring. MPD is about faithfulness to God's call. And all we're being called to do is be God's hands, feet, and mouth and inviting people to partner in a specific way of spreading the gospel. When we have missionaries who fundraise, we literally can't send you alone. So when God calls you, he actually doesn't just call you. He's actually calling 40 to 50 to 100 of people, like friends, families, people that you don't even know, to this mission as well. Don't give up on your vision. You can't stop 
stop believing because it is the vision or the faith that is the activating agent that brings it to pass. This is a vital aspect of your ministry. Do you have a vision or does the vision have you? Because when the vision has you, when it comes from the Lord himself, it's contagious. Micah, Micah, the last guy, is a friend of mine, and I love that. Do you have a vision, or does the vision have you? And the vision is contagious. When you're telling people about what God is doing, and you're doing it with excitement, and you're telling them how he's moved you, how he's changed you, what he's teaching you, and what he's doing over there, people don't know everything that's going on around the world. You'd be amazed and what people don't understand that God is still doing and how he's using people to change the world. So we try and meet people where they are. We call it responding to need. People don't care what you know till they know that you care. So show them you care by loving them where they are. Look, if you're in here and you're not a medical person, that's okay. There's lots of opportunities. I'm not. There's still opportunities to go serve in the gospel. Um, we need teachers, sports ministry, accountants, you name it, if you've got a passion for it, God can use it for his glory overseas. I'm going to show you another, oh, well, we're going to do this, and hopefully I have the other video after this. Sorry, I, I sent them the PowerPoint and gave them the videos to add later, so they did a great job by helping me because I couldn't add the videos. I'm not technologically savvy. So here's the questions. Why am I going? Know the answer. Has anybody, has anybody gone overseas long-term or short-term? Why did you go? To love people. How was it? Amazing. Someone else? Yes, sir. Advance the gospel. Hallelujah. And I know you, meant, I know you said when you're loving people, I know you're advancing the gospel too, trust me. Yeah. It's amazing the opportunities we have. Trust me, I know there's opportunities right here in Houston. I know there's opportunities in the U.S. And people said, why don't you just do it here? Here's my answer. There's a lot of people that do it here. There's not many that will go. I mean, with our organization, we partner with a local church. We're not, it's not about me. It's not about the tall, old, white man. It's not. It's about glorifying God. By the way, I'm talking about myself. We have to remember, I'm telling you again, who's your provider? It's not me working hard. That's not it. That's, I'm not the provider. It's him. He is my provider. I need to remember that in all the things I do. Will he? Yes, he will. So why should people give him prey? Are you worth it? Am I worth it? I'm not sure I am, but I know he is. If you're hearing him, if you're listening to him, do not let this be a reason you don't go. Don't let support reason be a reason you don't go. Especially if you're medical. Oh my gosh, there are so many doctors that see it as a humanitarian need that will partner with you financially, and they may not be a believer. I think it was Billy Graham that said, I don't care where the money comes from, I'll wash it with the blood of Jesus, and it'll be clean, and it'll be used for his glory. Look, and, and here's the thing. If you have doctors that partner with you that aren't believers, you get to speak in their life. They'll probably read your newsletter and hear about what you're doing, and you don't know how that's going to impact them. I mean, I went to church for two years before I became a believer. You don't know what it's going to take for someone to do that. Maybe it's the story of an arrow in someone's heart and God saving him. Maybe it's someone, just physical therapy used overseas. Why should we invite others? Look, most people I know are on the mission field because someone invited them. So please hear me. We need you. Whether it's SIM, AIM, or the, the other organizations downstairs, please go. If you're thinking about it and praying about it, talk to some of the organizations. We're here till this afternoon. Talk to some of the organizations, whether it's me or someone else, and figure out what you want to do and what your passion is and what they're about. Or just go by and pick up literature if you don't want to talk to anybody. It's out on all our tables. Pick up some stuff. I even brought some stuff from different organizations. If you're thinking about a short-term trip, CMDA is a great table to stop at. Christian Medical and Dental Association. They have our 40 trips this coming year. If you don't know and you want to do something, if you're a nurse and you want to go help at a nursing college, go to 
my friends at Egg Bay Medical Center. They're in Africa as well, and they're doing a great job. Hear me, there's a lot of opportunities. Let's see what we got next. I'm pretty sure it's the other video. Nope, is there another video? I just have one video. I'm missing a video, I'm so sorry, that's on me. So, okay, I'm gonna go, do y'all have any questions? I'm working on two, yes. I'm working on a project called Sports Friends. It's a ministry in over 18 countries where we use a ball and a Bible to make God's name known. And in the 21 years it's been going, we have our two, over 250,000 kids who have come to faith. Yeah, that's one of the projects I'm working on. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I would say he's got it. God has it. Trust him. I mean, seriously, in my, in my 24 years as a believer, that's what he keeps teaching me every year. He keeps building my trust. And I would say he's, he has it. And don't, you can worry, but don't. He has it. Trust him. She asked if I could, sorry, that's a great thing. I apologize. She asked if I could go back 20 years and tell myself something, what would I tell myself? Did I have that right? And I said, just to trust him sooner and trust him more right away. Because I want to hold on to control. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm a little bit of a control freak. I like dotting my eyes, crossing my T's, checking my boxes. Any other questions? Oh, I don't think any. I also, I have three copies of this one book. I actually have two at home, so if you're in Houston and you want this. This is a book, it's called Journey on a Dusty Road by my friend Bill Ardell. He's the one who worked in that surgery of taking the arrow out of the heart. It's a um, book about 20 years of missions. If you want this book, I'm happy to give, I have one copy here, I have two copies at my table. I'm happy to give them away if they help you. So I'm happy to do that. And then if you, if, Someone, if there's a fourth copy you wanted, I promise I can get it to you because I've got five. He gave me five to give away. So feel free. Any other questions? Um, I would say as a younger person, like explaining and uh, casting like vision to my parents or my family uh, about missions, a lot of times the question I get is, or the response I get is like, oh, that's not a real job, you know, and it's not real because you're support raising. And so like, I, I don't know, I think my question is, how do I, how do I like kind of shed light and cast vision to them? And I don't know, not that I need their approval, of course, but just how do I explain that to non-believers um, and also to believers who just don't get it? Like why, why would you raise support instead of something else, if that makes yeah. sense? Yeah, and my, my, I, it makes total sense. So what I would tell people is it's, what's God leading, it's what God is leading us to do now. I have confirmation in multiple different ways and that's why I'm doing it. I, I can't tell you I understand it. It's, it's not the path I would choose. It's not. But I know it's what I'm supposed to do. And that's, it may be a corny answer, but it's just true. And here's the other crazy thing, is it, it can cost relationships. I took, I took my in-laws, only grandkids overseas. And I have two sets of in-laws, one wife, two sets of in-laws. And it, it costs one of those relationships for seven years. But he is worthy. The best part of that story is the relationship is better than ever now, but for seven years it was not. But it will cost relationships. That wasn't the only one. But in all of it, I'll tell you, he's worthy. And he has you. Yes, sir. I just really appreciate the emphasis on prayer. And as I reflect right now on the last few years of my journey, 
I realize how much of it's been on, you know, trying to make it happen and, you know, and, and not enough on prayer and, inv and involving people to be a part of it, especially through prayer, uh, the vision. And so I tend to make things too complicated. So there's probably a simple way to go about this. And it, I'm sure it depends on the situation. There's not like a, I'm not looking for a canned response here, but what are some ways you've seen that, um, you've involved people in prayer because I do want to go back and really be serious about that and have people praying into this ministry and really have that commitment and be real about it. And so my complicated mind goes to, how do I do that? Do I check in every, you know, all of those things. And, and I don't want to do that. I know that God will lead that, but have you seen some ways of involving people and still keeping them kind of up to date with how things are going? And I don't know, what is that? How does yeah. that play out? No, so I, I follow a lot of missionaries, um, and I've got some that literally I'm in their WhatsApp group. They have a group of like 20 that they send prayer requests out to, sometimes weekly, sometimes a couple times a week, sometimes every other week, whatever it is. So that's that. I've got another missionary that sends one out, a newsletter every two weeks, just short, but with concise prayer points. I literally have a missionary that today's the 17th, and my day every month to pray for her and her family is the 17th. So there's, I mean, they could pick their birthday, right? The, mine is the 30th. So the 30th of every month, I pray for that person. But they asked me, their family said, we need someone to pray on the 17th. Would you do that? So on the 15th, I send them a message on Signal, another messaging app, and say, hey, I just want to make sure, how can I pray for you? That doesn't mean I only pray for them on that day. But those are ways that I've seen people involve me in prayer that I think are really great. And some of the WhatsApp groups, it goes back and forth a lot. So I've got another friend that has a group that just puts the prayer request and people can't respond. It's my favorite group. Um, I love knowing that people pray. I just don't need to see all of them in writing. I'm mean. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I don't have a question, but I just feel called to say something to the, to the group here. Um, I was, I keep hearing people here at the conference last year, this year, um, saying, oh, I can't, you know, I ask why, why are you here? And they say, well, I just, I'm interested, but, but I'm not going on a mission or anything. Like I'm, I'm definitely not going on it. You know, and I'm like, why? And they said, because I, I don't know if I can do it. I'm like, what do you mean? And I guess what I'm going to say is, um, if you, you're here for a reason, you're here because you're interested, you're curious, maybe God said something to you, you know, or revealed something to you. Um, for me personally, um, I received confirmation that, you know, this is my second mission year, you're going on a mission, you're going on a mission, excuse me. Um, and so, uh, you know, I've been prayerfully just asking for, you know, discernment and, and things, but when, when God tells you you're, you're, you need to go here, you're going there, you're doing this, just be obedient. Amen. And I'm, if anyone can do it, um, you know, if, or if I can do it, anyone can do it because I'm a single mom. Um, I have no family. My parents passed away. Um, and so, uh, I, and I don't, I don't make a, a ton of money, you know? So if I stop and I think, oh my gosh, it's going to take this amount of money. There's no way I can't do it. Or I'm, you know, I'm not qualified, you know, God can use you anywhere, everywhere. You may be, you know, I went on a mission trip last year to Ireland, and it, it took me a while, months, to get out of the mindset, like, you're not going on a mission trip, you're going on a vacation, what are you talking, why are you doing that, you know, that, that talk, but guess what, I shared the gospel with so many people, not even in our mission field, but on the airplane, yeah. in, in the uh, hotel bar, uh, I don't know if you, whatever you call it, the little, whatever, inside the hotel to people who were just curious. And I was just befriending them and talking to them. And to this day, like they're, they have, uh, it, there's incredible stories that came out of it. So don't, don't discredit yourself and don't think, oh, well, there's no way I can, or I'll never raise the money. There's just no way. If God is calling you to it, he'll see you through it. Amen. Period. You know, Amen. The, so don't just get over that and just keep going. Just yeah. say yes and do it. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, God doesn't necessarily call the equipped, but he does equip the called. Do you have it? anybody else? Or we, we need to wrap up in five minutes, four minutes. So I've been involved with support raising for over 50 years. And the thing that, uh, and I'm a big prayer partner and a donor to 
missionaries. But I would just exhort all of you who submit prayer requests that you be faithful about telling people what happened, uh, especially if it didn't come out the way that you thought, you know, so-called God didn't answer the prayer. Right. Just be honest about that, and, but be consistent in your reporting. Amen. Uh, that, that helps so much. And then as far as raising support, I, I've done it, I've supervised others. I think they have to trust you. They have to trust you. And I don't know, there's no three easy steps to how do I develop trust in, in me, but that's what I sense people are, humanly speaking, that's what motivates them. They say, when, when you say something, they believe you're telling the truth and that you're gonna do it. And you might think, well, don't all Christians do that? No, they don't. Yeah. So, thank you. Something to think about. Yeah, time for one more question. One more. Thanks, Obed. I have like um, two questions. Thank you for going up. First one is, how do you prepare your mind and family to be able to go to an area like Nigeria, which I know that people and you know, a lot of stuff that is going on, both security and the mind. That's my question. Yeah. And another one is about the. Do you ever use social media? How um, do you have suggestion on how to use social media to raise like funding? So. I don't use social media. I've been told a lot of people to do. I don't personally, and you asked if I do. Some people do. I do not. In fact, Facebook locked me out for the second time. I still haven't figured out why they did it the first time, let alone the second. Uh, how did I prepare my family for Nigeria? Um, we moved from Houston to a small town in North Carolina. That was part of the prep. Honestly, not my plan. His. And he just got us ready. There's no real preparation. I don't care how much you prepare for two or three years to figure it out. You're still going to face things you're not ready for when you go overseas. And the biggest way to prepare is to know you trust him. That's my biggest preparation was just trusting him in everything, in the valleys and the hard things. My wife and I, our first argument, I know I've got to wrap in 50 seconds. Our first argument we couldn't really have because all the windows are open and everybody could hear everything. So we took a walk. And we were just arguing as we were walking and someone stopped to greet us and meet us. And so we put on our happy faces for 30 seconds and then we started arguing again so nobody had to hear. But God is good and to be glorified through it all. So I'm gonna pray and you can come find me for any questions. So Joel is next with C10. If you don't know where you're going next, stay in this room because it'll be better. All right, Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for these men and women. And God, I just pray that you encourage their hearts. And Father, let them know what you're calling them to do next and just help them to see you, to trust you, and to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.